Okay, so why don't we get started? Um, hello, everyone. I'm Carl Lejway, the provost here at UConn. I want to welcome everyone to the fifth and final event in our provost distinguished speaker series for the academic year. This series is an annual event where we invite our recently appointed board of trustees, distinguished professors and endowed chairs to share their scholarship with us. We are really pleased to share this opportunity to bring our community together, particularly now where it is so hard to do that in appreciation and celebration of the exceptional work we do at UConn. I would be remiss to not acknowledge the work it takes to arrange this series, which has been managed primarily by Amanda Pitts in our office in partnership with Vice Provost Michael Bradford. I sincerely want to thank Katharina von Hammerstein for sharing her scholarship with us today. We've asked the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Dean Julie Wade to introduce Professor von Hammerstein and her talk, Voices of Genocide, from German colonialism in Africa to the Southern District Federal Court of New York. Before I do that though, um, before I turn it over to Dean Wade, I, one thing I very much appreciate about being here at UConn is that our deans are, have strong and, and prolific research careers themselves. And I just wanna say one thing about Dean Wade. I actually have a, a common colleague and I, I asked for just a little bit of, about her and he, he quickly sent this to me. Uh, Dean Wade is one of the premier comparative neuroendocrinologists of her generation. She completed path-breaking work at the cellular and molecular level on steroid hormone action in the brain of abundant lizard Oh, I forgot to get a pronunciation on this. And Oles Carolinus. Hopefully no one knows if I didn't pronounce Close it. Enough. Right. All right. She's also performed foundational studies on the sexual differentiation of the vocal control system of the songbird, the zebra finch. At Michigan State, she was unique in the field in maintaining for many years a state-of-the-art research program on both lizards and songbirds. And this person saying, as her colleague in the field of behavioral neuroendocrinology, he thinks we should figure out a way to clone her and allow Julie number two to return to her true calling of comparative work in hormones, brain, and behavior because she's sorely missed. So with that, I will turn it over to Dean Wade. Well, thanks, Carl. That was um, unexpected, and I know exactly who that colleague was. Um, so thank you. That was very kind. So it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Board of Trustees Distinguished Professor Katarina Van Hammerstein. She received her PhD in German literature at UCLA and her undergraduate degree in mathematics, German, and education from the University of Göttingen in Germany. Her research spans humanities disciplines, crossing the boundaries of literary criticism, post-colonial studies, gender studies, war studies, and human rights. She's published 12 books, more than 70 articles studying German and Austrian literature, art, and nonfiction from the 18th through the 21st centuries. <clears throat> Excuse me, some themes of her research include human rights issues and collective conflict. So white authors representations of black people in German language texts and black authors perspectives on Germany. Uh, women authors self writings as political practice and German romanticism. She has also contributed to interdisciplinary curriculum development, connecting the learning of second languages with courses in history, art history, political science, geography and film. Over her career, Professor von Hammerstein has given numerous presentations in a dozen countries across the globe. Uh, so I'm very happy to welcome her to talk, welcome her to talk today about voices of genocide from German colonialism in Africa to the Southern District Federal Court of New York. So Katarina, please take it away. Thank you, Provost Lejoui. Thank you, Dean Wade, for this kind introduction. And now I have to first figure out the technology to share my screen with you guys. And um, here we go. Okay, this should work now. One second. Okay, I think, I think we are there. Okay. I would like to preface my talk today by quoting our university's official statement about acknowledging that the land on which the University of Connecticut is located is the territory of the Mohegan, 
Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Shattycoke, Golden Hill Pogasset, Nipmuc, and Lenape peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. And that's the end of that quote. This reference to our work on land that was once used by indigenous peoples offers a segue to my presentation about the land loss of the indigenous over Herero people to white European colonial settlers, in this case Germans, around 1900. This took place in another part of the world, the former colony of German Southwest Africa. Here we have a map. Today is Namibia. This conflict over land and water led to the first genocide of the 20th century. You are probably familiar with the Holocaust, with the Armenian genocide, probably also with the genocide of the Tutsi in Rwanda, Native Americans in the United States, and currently the Rohingya in Myanmar. But you may not have heard about the genocide of the Ovaherero. Some of you may wonder what historical events affecting another people in an, at another time in a faraway country have to do with you. Actually, the world still very much grapples with the long lasting heritage of colonialism as seen in such problems as race and white privilege, racism, sorry, racism and white privilege, the exploitation of indigenous peoples, and general dehumanization, dehumanizing treatment of specific populations. We still struggle with questions of justice and reparations for past wrongs. And when it comes to documenting human rights violations, we see every day how crucial witness accounts and evidence are. For example, just in recent weeks, in the death of George Floyd, it was thanks to cell phone cameras that visual evidence of police brutality against an African-American citizen could give rise to national outrage and eventually be presented at court. My talk today looks at the role witnessing play may play across generations in bringing evidence of past human rights violations, in this case, the Ovaherero genocide, to public awareness and thus strengthen the, uh, the victim group's present day agency and calls for justice. The first half of my talk provides historical background about the Ovaherero genocide and some theoretical approaches to witnessing. Then I will discuss how witnessing of these past wrongs has, uh, has been brought to the attention of wider audiences in three different examples. A musical performance of Ovaherero oral history, a US federal court of law, and international theater stages. Let, me, let us start with a bit of colonial history. In the scramble for Africa in the 1890s, when European powers carved up Africa among themselves, Germany gained control over the colonies of Togo, Cameroon, German East Africa, which is today's Tanzania, Rwanda and Burundi, and German Southwest Africa, today's Namibia. Subsequently, German economic migrants, as Namibian historian Effa Okupa appropriately terms the white colonial settlers, arrived in pastoral central, central Namibia. Given the ideological climate of European colonialism, they justified, much like white European settlers in North America, their seizure of indigenous, indigenous people's land on the grounds of self-declared white supremacy, supposed 
civilizational and religious superiority, and a sense of racialized social Darwinism as manifested in the survival of the militarily fittest. The semi-nomadic Ovaherero were the most powerful local population, owning huge herds of hundreds of thousands of cattle and controlling vast grazing grounds. To this day, the design of Ovaherero women's horn-shaped headdresses pays homage to cows that used to be at the core of Ovaherero economy and cultural identity. The Ovaherero, after they initially collaborated with Germans, soon <clears throat> saw their livelihood threatened by sust uh, substantial land, water, and cattle theft, as well as violent abuses by the Germans, including rape of women and children. Ovaherero resistance to the, these assault, assaults peaked in a guerrilla rebellion in 1904 under the leadership of Paramount Chief Samuel Maharero. The indigenous fighters explicitly spared women, German women, children, and missionaries. After initial successes, 35,000 Ovaherero and their cattle withdrew to the water rich Waterberg region and awaited peace talks. The German Empire responded instead with genocide. The German general in charge, Lothar von Trotta, termed this military conflict a race war against non-humans. He encircled and attacked the assembled over Herero populace and issued an infamous extermination order that proves that the intent to commit genocide, that proves the intent to commit genocide, as it would later be defined by the 1948 United Nations Convention of Genocide for, on Genocide, and I quote, as acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial or religious group. Trotha's extermination order reads, the Herero are no longer German subjects. Within the German borders, self-proclaimed German borders, mind you, every male Herero, armed or unarmed, will be shot. I will no longer take in women or children, but will have them fired at. Today, we call this ethnic cleansing. When tens of thousands over Herero fled the German encirclement eastward through the only opening, Trotta ordered his troops to pursue men, women and children into the Omaheke desert, part of the waterless Kalahari desert. Here they were either shot to death at random, were poisoned at the rare water holes, or perished of thirst, starvation, or, and exposure, trying to reach the British protectorate for uh, Bichwana land, today's Botswana. Others were taken to concentration camps, where malnutrition, exhaustion, and slave labor killed 45% of the internees. They died like flies, testified over Herero eyewitness Samuel Carrico later. Between 1904 and 1908, an estimated total of 80,000 men, women, and children were killed. That were 80% of all over Herero and also 50% of all Nama people. Survivors were dispossessed of their land and cattle and lost all the economic, uh, lost their economic foundation. Applicable here is Judith Butler's observation that in war, which includes Trotter's concept of race war, human persons would be understood as subjects of rights, entitled to protection, whereas non-persons or non-humans, in Trotter's words, would not. To kill a non-person, indeed, an entire population of non-persons, thus calls upon a racism 
that differentiates in advance who will count as alive and who will not. To the colonizers, black over Herero lives did not matter. The mass killing of the over Herero and Nama was acknowledged as genocide by the United Nations in 1985. In Germany, however, the government, uh, sorry, in Germany, however, the Foreign Office has only used the term genocide for these atrocities since 2015. Individual politicians have apologized for the genocide, but the German parliament as a body has not yet acknowledged the term nor agreed to reparations. In, 2015, uh, in 2017, the Overherero and Nama filed a class action lawsuit here in the United States at the District Court of the Southern District of New York against the Federal Republic of Germany as legal successor of the German Empire. They demand damages as reparations for the genocide, and I will return to this lawsuit a little later. International scholarship on the German Overherero colonial war and genocide has for the longest time concentrated predominantly on texts by, by and about white German males, colonial officers, administrators, settlers. By contrast, my own larger research project, of which I can only give you a teeny tiny taste today, my own project has broadened the focus to an entire array, an entire polyphony of voices, black and white, over Herero and German, men and women, oral and written, voices that have for the most part eluded scholarly attention in the global north. Again, today, today only the tip of the iceberg. I approach this topic not as a historian, not as an anthropolo anthropologist, legal expert or political activist, but as a white female German-American scholar of German literature and thus analyst of texts. We have in the audience today Dr. Ngondi Kamatuka from the University of Kansas and president of the Associated Association of the Overherero Genocide in the United States. On this photo, you can see him as the fourth from the right, uh, next to his wife, Luisa. Dr. Kamatuka gave a talk here at Yukon in February. And he is an Overherero descendant and activist. And Ngondi, thank you very much for joining us again today. Unlike Dr. Kamatuka, I am a descendant of the colonial perpetrator nation, Germany. I do not assume a position of speaking for the Overherero or the Nama. This is not my place. Rather, I hope that my scholarship will further make the case of the Overherero genocide widely known, more widely known than it already is. Now, let's take a closer look at witnessing. Why is it important? Political scientist Michel Givoni writes, bearing witness is an attempt to document and to make known a wrong that is otherwise bound to be concealed, denied or forgotten so as to infuse the cause of the victims with the power of facts. This definition applies to cell phone recording of police brutality in the United States today as much as to evidence recorded in Overherero stories and songs about the genocide a century ago in Southern Africa. I also draw on the forensic architect E.L. Weizmann's approach to examining evidence of human rights violations. Weizmann differentiates between two constitutive sites of forensics, the field and the forum. The field is the site of investigation, 
where we find the evidence. And the forum is the place where the results of an investigation is presented, are presented, where the evidence is interpreted and publicized. In my investigation of textual testimonies about the Ovaherero genocide, the witness, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> the witness accounts reflect fields, fields of evidence of past atrocities and are my site of investigation. When these texts are presented at a forum, be that a, at a musical performance, in a courtroom, or on a theater stage, the texts bring interpreted evidence of past atrocities to the attention of local, national, or international public audiences. I list here um, the categories of witness figures according to um, Didier Fasson and uh, Giorgio Agamben, but I cannot go into details here. The Ovaherero insistence on telling their own stories, their own history, was and is one way for the uh, genocide victims and their descendants to claim authority over narrating their own past and claim agency in shaping their own present and future. Let's finally get to my three examples. Three examples of texts that contain evidence of the genocide and of forums where this evidence is presented. The first is an example of the Ovaherero long tradition of oral history, of retelling oral history, and is a song entitled The Flight that was actually performed by an eyewitness of the genocide and recorded by anthropologist Kirsten Alnaes in the 1970s. Please notice that the singer employs direct speech between Paramount Chief Samuel Ovaherero and his wife Joanna, and thereby brings to life the historical turn when German troops under Trotter attacked the Ovaherero at the Waterberg with the Ovaherero's one and only escape route being eastward through the desert. I'm going to read this now. Herero person, where are you going? They, the Germans, have prepared. Give me my stick, my gun. They are going to fight the war. They are going to shoot. Choo! They are running with guns under their arms. You all prepare. Let us go. Joanna, let us go and drink from the shallow water hold in the Omaheke. Choo! Joanna, carry the child on your back. Joanna, come, we must go. The child, my child, where has it gone? It has fallen, has been killed. Samuel, hear the guns. People are distraught. The child has lost its mother. The mother has lost her husband. The lambs have gone to suckle the goats which does not happen in nature. So this is an unnatural situation. Let us go, let us go. Choo! They shoot. Although this eyewit an eyewitness performs this song, it, is, it does not reflect an actually observed encounter between the leading over Herero couple. Rather, it provides fictionalized evidence of the general confusion, as we see in the, in the first sentence, the general confusion, disorientation and fear caused by the unexpected sudden need to frantically flee. The song zeroes in on the terrifying historical and personal moment that changed everything. A wife, and mother 
realizes the vulnerability of her child, the next generation, that she can no longer protect, protect and the precariousness of, an, of her entire people, whom the Overherero leadership can no longer defend. The dr dramatic dialogue and the onomatopoetic leitmotif, tune, recreate for the Overherero audience, even decades later, the immediacy of the traumatic experience of 1904. The mention of the shallow waterholes triggers images of suffering as the listeners know how miserable their forebears died in the desert. The ever more pressing, let us go, we must go, relates the urgency of the flight. The use of personal pronouns in they, the Germans, are going to shoot and we, the Overherero must go, underscores the imbalance of military power. The male speaker and leading historical figure, Samuel Maharero, stands for decisive practical action in the face of disaster. Give me my stick and you all prepare, let us go. The song's focus, however, is the female speaker's personal helplessness and concern for individual human beings. Naming child, mother, and husband as victims, she refers to them according to their family ties and thus highlights the economic and social collapse and the personal pain of the Overherero refugees. Bearing witness, the song paints a vivid picture of the humanitarian catastrophe in the absence of any rule of law and the collective shock at realizing that even civilian overherero lives had lost all value in the eyes of the German enemy troops. If we apply Weizmann's concept of field and forum, the text of the song provides evidence of indiscriminate killings. The song's performance in the 1970s served as a forum that bridges past and present and contributed, bridged past and present, and contributed to creating post, a post-genocidal community among the surviving and exiled over Herero. Through the, through the translation and publication, it, is also, it has also reached an international audience, including ours here today. Overall, the Overherero history includes stories of both incredible victimization and courageous agency. My second example continues along the lines of turning evidence of victimization into the demonstration of agency. Activists have for many activists in Germany, Namibia, and the United States have for many years called attention to the German to Germany's other genocide, other than the Holocaust. In 2017, the Overherero and Nama peoples created an additional highly visible forum for their cause. They filed a class action complaint against Germany at the federal United States District Court, Southern District of New York. I'll be happy to explain why of all places they could file in New York and in the United States. Uh, I'll be happy to do that in the question and answer session. The essence of the 96 page class action complaint is comprised in the following charges against Germany. The mass killings intended to exterminate the Overherero and Nama peoples, the systematic rape, the expropriation of land, cattle, and other property, the herding of survivors into concentration camps, their exploitation as slave laborers, and the use of Overherero and Nama corpses and skulls 
for pseudo-scientific experimentation. And that all these, that these actions collectively constitute genocide under international law. The complaint actually picks up Chota's own language about non-humans, in that it spells out that he, Chota, mistreated a targeted population as a subhuman group. Yet, the complaint redirects the very term to reveal the colonial Germans' own lack of humanity by refer referring first to the inhumane and subhuman conditions in the concentration camps, and second, in the quote, and in, and I quote, the experimentation on corpses and skulls in a Gaulish effort to establish that the indigenous Africans were untermenschen, subhumans, and that the German race was supposedly superior, end quote. The indigenous Africans that Trotter excluded in 1904 from the community of German subjects are today, according to the 2007 United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, entitled to participation in decision-making in matters which would affect their rights through the representation chosen by themselves. Germany's violation of this de declaration by denying them the voice in the negotiations between the German and the Namibian government is another charge in the complaint. In fact, the Overheerero and Nama do not feel represented by their own Namibian government because it is dominated by another ethnicity, the, the Ovambo, and their self-interest. You see here the Overheerero's activist motto, it cannot be without us, sorry, it cannot be about us without us, another expression of self-determination and agency. Last September, the court dismissed the Overheerero, the New York court, dismissed the Overheerero and Nama class action complaint against Germany. However, not at all, because it did not acknowledge the genocide, but on technical grounds, because Germany is protected by the Foreign Sovereign Immunity Act and cannot be sued in the United States unless certain exceptions apply. However, this lawsuit generated significant press coverage by newspapers around the world, from Al Jazeera to The Guardian to The New York Times, Washington Post, you name it. The Ova Herero and Nama currently, complain, uh, currently contemplate next steps. Now, my third and last example, and I will be brief, is a US American theater play connecting the Overherero genocide with the African diaspora on public, station, uh, on public stages in the United States and the United Kingdom. The English language play by American playwright Jackie Siblis Drury has the long title, We are proud to present a presentation about the Herero of Namibia, formerly known as Southwest Africa, from the German Südwest Afrika, between the years 1884 and 1915. It, premieres, it premiered in Chicago in 2012. It is by no means, though, a piece of collected over Herero memory, but it does quote verbatim from Trotter's extermination order, and it includes a scene about white German colonial troops forcing black over Herero into the desert. So the play does not so much dramatize the Overherero genocide per se, but rather takes the Overherero experience of displacement, murder, and discrimination as a point of departure to address, to address racial tensions in the United States today. By finding the Overherero in us, that is, in themselves, 
the characters create a connection between the historical events and their own discrimination, particularly as African Americans. One character has an epiphany. The story of the Oberherero was about people I'd never heard of in a place I'd never cared about. An entire tribe of people nearly destroyed. People who looked like my family, my grandmother. And suddenly I felt like I have a lineage. My tribe has been murdered. By relating two outgrowths of colonial Euro-American racism in Africa, the displacement of the Oberherero and the displacement of Africans to the slave trade, both leading to mass killings, misery and consequences today. Jury's play thus serves as a forum, forum in the sense of E.L. Weizmann, a forum that interprets and publicly presents evidence of these human rights violations. It makes the topic of the Oberherero genocide personal and relevant to a present day American theater audience. Now, we have seen three examples of such forums. The performance of the song, The Flight, has contributed to creating community and agency within the post-genocidal Oberherero community. The class action lawsuit in New York has sought justice and gained international attention. And Jury's play inspires through entertainment and information the catharsis in theater audiences. It is the presentation that turns the experience of victimization into agency by not letting the history of the, of the victimized be forgotten or marginalized. Only on the basis of testimonial narratives, and I show again here those categories by Didier Fassin that I don't go into detail with, only on the basis of testimonial narratives can today's Oberherero political activists like Ngondi Kamatuka pursue their goal to have the German parliament officially acknowledge the genocide, officially apologize for it, and pay reparations directly to the Oberherero and Nama communities. So I'm coming to my end here, but one more minute, please. Allow me to connect what we have learned about publicizing the Oberherero genocide to three open and big questions. The long reach of colonialism that has resulted in dispar uh, disparities of wealth and status between the global north and the global south and between diverse populations within our societies. So this is a statement. We know that already. Scholars have said that multiple times. But where do we go from here? Related to that, the question, what are appropriate forums for Germany and perhaps all Western democracies to publicly take responsibility for what South African historian Sabelo Ndolu Gaceni calls the dirty history of colonialism and racism, well alive today, as we know. And which corresponding forums can bring sidelined voices, such as those of the Oberherero and many others, from the margins and to the center? Lastly, and that concerns us, what is the role of our public flat, uh, platforms in academia? Our research, our scholarship, our teaching, in what I'm sorry, Lovu Gacheni calls the broader issues or the broader issue of rehumanization of the dehumanized. Thank you. I have to stop sharing here.
Oh my goodness. Katharina, that was uh, absolutely powerful. I so, I so appreciate that. People are clapping and snapping. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Let's go ahead. Let's give it up. Let's give it up. Thank you so much for that. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a dark history, but one that we really need to we really need to hear about and to appreciate. I saw Drury's play in Providence a number of years ago, and um, although the title takes up half of the night of the performance, it is an absolutely powerfully beautiful, beautiful play. I don't know if I cried so much um, in one theater performance. So so thank you for that. Um, I, I, I'm sure there are tons of questions out there. I'm just going to kick it off with this one particular question, which maybe has a little ancillary into the issue of the U.S. court and why the U.S. court and maybe just some some depth in that particular conversation because I'm really fascinated by that. And of course, you made me more fascinated by saying I'll talk about more of it later. But, you know, one of the things about theater is that we, we are always asking who gets to tell whose story. Um, who, whose voice, you know, can actually tell whose whose story is it? Um, the, the community from which that story is driven? Is it from someone outside of the community with a with a different perspective? Who gets to tell whose story? But my question is just a little little different here in the sense that who who gets to tell the story so that it's heard? So that somebody has heard it. And what is the distance between who that person might be or who that group might be and the affected group? Like what's in that space? What do we lose? Right in the translation of that, does that make sense? Makes great sense. And um, the first and foremost have to be the overherero and the nama, the affected group that talks about their history, their past, their present, and their future. And I don't presume to speak for them. What I hope. I'm doing is that I provide information that they can continue using for their purposes. Um, I had conversations with um, Ngondi Kamatuka about this, including the question if I, if I'm entitled as a white American German scholar to show pictures of victimization of the overherero. And of course, I don't want to fall into the trap of or into uh, uh, voyeurism of of uh, violence. And he said, since you talk about the case and make it more public, please do use these images and please do use uh, whatever you have to make our case more public. Again, they, they are very active in the United States with that lawsuit. And in Germany, um, there is a whole group called, uh, it's an NGO called um, Völkermord verjährt nicht. In English, that would be no amnesty for genocide. And of course, in Namibia, the authorities of the NAMA and uh, the uh, Overherero, the leadership is very active in making their case in Namibia. But as I mentioned, they don't feel represented by their own government because the NAMA and uh, Overherero are a minority in Namibia. Overherero approximately 7%, um, NAMA 5%, as opposed to the Ovambo majority, which is about 50%. So, um, I'm not sure if I addressed your question or if you would uh, like to go into more detail there. I mean, I think that's absolutely wonderful. Someone much smarter than me, you know, once said to me as a, as a, as a playwright, if you want to tell someone else's story, then you have to get down to the center and that takes time and that takes work. You know, that takes sweat equity in order to, to, to do that. And this is your research, this is your world. And so I'm listening to you, but you've also illuminated you know, this world from the place that you're in, um, you know, and, and the fact that you ask permission, right, to put those pictures, you know, that are so um, deeply connected to that experience for the people, even today, these many, many years later, I, I just find deeply impressive. So I, I personally just want to say thank you, right, for taking the time and, um, and putting yourself at the center, 
as close as you could get to the center of that story in order to work your way out and tell us of that experience. So I appreciate that. If I may respond to the term center, I think I purposefully purposefully try not to put myself into the center, <laughs> but the over here Rero are at the center and um, I contribute. Indeed, indeed, and I, maybe I have misspoken here, but I, I don't think we can ever have somebody else's lived experience. I don't think we can Absolutely. get to the absolute center of it because it belongs, it belongs to those people, but we can respect that, right? We can respect that and operate from that particular place. So I so appreciate that. I'm sure there's some really great questions out there. I don't want to, to um, take over the space here. If something doesn't pop up, I've, I've got a number of questions that I'm ready to ready to roll with. Is there someone out there? You don't have to put it in the chat. You can just unmute and, and jump right in. Can I ask a question? Please, please, please. That's why we're here. I, uh, I'm an employee of the uh, U.S. Army as a civilian. And uh, I remember going to one of these uh, Native American experiences where they talked about uh, one of the famous books. Um, it's blanking, but we'd all know it if I said it. It's uh, it's the one where the uh, various tribes were were um, led on these different marches and things. And I'm sorry, I'm blanking. But there was a historian there, and he represented the army's point of view. And they said that uh, by our definition, this was not a genocide because the U.S. government did not sanction what happened there. And I think by maybe international standards, that may be wrong. And I just think I, I just throw that out there as a comment and say, have you heard of this before to the speaker and how this is uh, worked on? If you don't know anything about it, I just wanted to throw that out there to say that's something that probably has to be fought today, because, as you say, things are defined by certain people in the cat a certain category who are distant from things and do not you know, look at the full spectrum of the ways to define things. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you for that question. Um, two items here. You mentioned uh, uh, the First Nation here in our country, uh, or, uh, Native Americans, and I want to to uh, emphasize how parallel some of the things that I talked about today are with, say, um, the the Dakota uh, or the Sioux, um, same same uh, peoples. Um, we. In, in, the human, in one of the Human Rights Institute's reading groups, we recently read a book by Eric Weitz, um, and I thank Sarah Silverstein for, for bringing that book into that group, um, where you could see the parallels with the human rights violations in our country here of indigenous peoples and the human rights violations that I talked about today in what's today Namibia. So that is one point. The other point that you brought up is, can we talk about genocide when the definition of genocide was only made up, created as late as 1948? And many governments have said, well, you know, back then, you know, it was a different time and we didn't call it genocide. And that is what had, has happened so far in Germany as well. It was not, I mean, but the Holocaust, was it a Holocaust, a genocide? Nobody would doubt, even though we, that was before 1948. So if we look at the other genocides, we can take the uh, definition of today or of since 1948 and apply it also to the past. And according to that definition, the Overherero and Nama genocide definitely is a genocide. And as I said, a number of politicians from Germany have already adopted that term. The Foreign Office has adopted that term of all times in 2015, because Germany had called on, um, on Turkey to acknowledge the Armenian genocide, the 100-year uh, 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 memo uh, uh, memory of the Armenian genocide in 2015. And then, of course, the Herero and Nama said, well, you know, if the Turkish are supposed to acknowledge the genocide of the Armen uh, the, the killing of the Armenians, you, Germany, please have to do the same. So the Foreign Office and, 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 and the, the Speaker of the German House, uh, the German Parliament, 
started using that term publicly, very explicitly. But the parliament has not yet. And if I'm honest, I'm not sure with the composition of the current parliament, if it will do so in the future. Marina, may, may I ask, it's at, from time to time, we are in danger of history being rewritten for social, political, sometimes economic reasons, and, I, and especially as time goes by. And I wonder if that's a danger in this particular situation and, and how the Herero people have kind of maintained uh, the historical truth of this moment. They say a genocide is a genocide is a genocide. And they have their witness accounts. Some of them I have been able to work with. And these witness accounts are the connection between the past and the present. And that was part of my argument that if you have these witness accounts, we can use them today on the fora, on the forums that are at our disposal. And the courtroom is one, the theater is another, um, uh, 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 oral history is another, uh, um, demonstrations in streets are another, and so forth. May I? Please, please. Th thank you so very much. I, uh, uh, Katarina, I really appreciate uh, uh, your presentation. It's a, it's a good one. As a direct descendant, my grandparents on my mother's side my, was born in 1907. This was the height of the genocide. And on my father's side, 1915, also the height of the genocide. So uh, the stories that were told to us are real. In academia, we sort of uh, a disregard oral stories and go from uh, what's been written in books by a mostly Eurocentric point of view. They tend to disregard the oral history of the people themselves. And, and uh, Professor von Hammerstein has done a good job of talking with us and asking for permission to, can I do this as a person of, uh, of German blood? I'm in German blood as well, not through voluntary, uh, but through other means, you understand what I mean, on both sides of my parents. Now, the point of uh, asking for permission is very critical in our culture. Uh, Michael, you asked that question. We took the lawyers who are representing us in the court case to Namibia, and we had to ask for permission for myself as a descendant and the lawyers to stand on the ground on which the examination order was issued in 1904. We just could not go there and stand on those net hollow ground. We had to be given permission. The reason they gave permission to the lawyer said, uh, you are our telescope, you are our eyes to tell our stories. So that's the reason I was given permission to get on that hollow ground so he can feel the crying of the people who were dying hundred and some years ago. We still feel that with it um, at, at that point. So briefly, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm glad you invited me to be in this space. I really appreciate what you've done and thank you very much. We thank you for telling our story as well and anybody else. Thank you, Ngondi. I really, really, really appreciate first that you came in February to speak at UConn and that you are coming again here today. Thank you. Uh, Carl? Lash, we're sorry, my friend, but brother, I didn't, I didn't acknowledge you. <laughs> <laughs> and here you come. Just as a background, Carl Lejoué at the University of Kansas collaborated with Ngondi Kamatuka at the University of Kansas. <laughs> I'm actually writing a private note to you right now because I didn't know you would be here today. So it's it's great to see you and, and your voice is, is really important on this topic. And I'm so glad the two of you have this collaboration. Indeed, indeed, indeed. We, we have um, um, some time for more questions. I see a hand up. Please, please go ahead. Uh, Professor von Hammerstein, I'm wondering uh, for those uh, German public figures who deny uh, what are their grounds for denying other than anachronism? Do they have other arguments that they offer as to why 
the German government should not recognize uh, this as a genocide? I can only suspect. Um, making a public acknowledgement of the genocide may be connected, and, and Gondi Kamatuka may be able to say something about that too, may be connected to giving legitimacy to reparation requests. And therefore, and quite frankly, I suspect that not only the Germans are sus uh, cautious about that, but that the neighboring countries, the other European colonial powers, are watching this case very carefully because it may be one of the first cases where the genocide is acknowledged, where reparations may be acknowledged. Let's hope that will happen. And then there will be other populations in Africa asking the Belgian. I, I was wondering whether there has been any effort uh, on, behalf, on behalf of the peoples whom the Belgians destroyed. Um, it's very difficult to compare genocides, also Holocaust, colonial genocides and so forth. Um, I don't know about the other genocides. I don't know what the uh, um, what the uh, uh, um, ac activists are doing about them right now. But I suspect that there is a concern that the French may have, the British may have, the the the, the Belgians, the Italians, the Spanish, because this goes back centuries, and all the European powers will one day, I think, and I hope, own up to the current riches they have based on the colonialism in the past. So I don't know, Dick, if I responded to your question, but I think it is this in this big question of acknowledging the genocide, um, next step reparations, the next step other countries uh, will have uh, to acknowledge their genocides as well and so forth. Let's keep this forgotten. I'm not sure whether the Germans are trying to keep it forgotten. They try to call it atrocities. They try to call it, um, you know, uh, human rights violations. They try to evade, just avoid that particular term. Mm -hmm. Ngondi, I see you nodding. Um, <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, again, again, it's uh, it, it's like a a, a criminal who has uh, who appeared in who appears in court and tell the judge and tells the judge what kind of uh, uh, penalty ought to be meted against him or her. That's what Germany is doing. That we committed this, but we have the right to determine to tell you what needs to, to ha happen. We go to the Namibian government, tell the Namibian government that don't call it genocide, otherwise we won't give you development aid. We are not about development aid in Namibia. That's something different from, uh, and by the way, briefly, the land that was taken from my great great grandparents, illegally confiscated, is still in the hands of the, of the great great children of those people in Namibia to this day. Powerful, powerful. Um, I know we're kind of at the last minute, but I will please, um, Katharina. If, 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 I, if I may, um, we have two minutes, one minute, and I would like to say some thanks. Is that okay if I do that? Please. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks, Ngondi Kamatuka, that you came today. That is that is a given. But also thanks, of course, to everyone who was uh, involved in making this event happen today. Um, but also, I would like to go back a little and thank our former class dean, Ross McKinnon, who was instrumental in uh, making the Humanities Institute happen and the Human Rights Institute happen. And talking about the Human Rights Institute, I specifically want to thank Richard Wilson and Kathy Liebal. Richard Wilson, because without you, Richard, if you're here, you may be somewhere in this uh, room today. Without you, I would not have had this turn in my scholarship and in my teaching. It was you, Richard, you specifically, who, who 
changed my entire scholarship. Um, and of course, I want to thank Global Affairs, which is also in charge of the Human Rights Institute, and my former and current department heads, Gustavo Nanclares and Jennifer Turney, who nominated me for this incredibly honorable award. I, I, you know, I don't even know how to, what to say about this award. So I want to say that administrators matter. Administrators matter. Um, and of course, I want to thank my German colleagues in the German program, not German colleagues, they are my colleagues in the German program for <laughs> many years of fantastic collaboration. Uh, and I want to thank Joey Horsley, who has uh, helped me edit my my text for today, because as you know, people with a funny foreign accent, they have twisted tongues and sometimes the sentences don't come out right. So it's very helpful if uh, uh, if we uh, have editors. And <laughs> since I'm at it, while I'm at it, I want to make a pitch for my field, the humanities. The hum um, I, I'm thankful that the committee who selected me for this incredible uh, honor has selected a woman, a foreigner, and a faculty from the humanities, which means that the that Yukon is valuing the importance of the humanities that are crucial, I believe, in many new ways again, because as you all know, we are in the middle of crises, all kinds of crises, environmental, uh, uh, crisis of democracy, uh, crisis of uh, uh, racial relations. Um, so we have many crises and we need the humanities to make people think and to think up a better world and it is not only as the president of the MLA, my modern language association president, which is, by the way, Judith Butler, um, it is not only that the humanities um, needs the other disciplines to flourish, but the other disciplines from STEM to everywhere, I believe, need the humanities to bring ethics into the developments um, to develop a better world that we are hopefully going to move towards, even though things look somewhat bleak, perhaps at the moment, with some bright lights. <laughs> thank you. And we want to thank you, Katarina, for this, this um, powerful uh, presentation. We want to thank you for the scope of your work. We want to thank you for placing this, this moment, this then now going to be history in our consciousness, which is where it needs to be. So thank you so much uh, for today. We really appreciate it. Thank you everyone who joined us today. I mean, you filled the room. She was a little worried that folks wouldn't come. We all knew better than that. And here you are. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. It's the last of our uh, um, Distinguished Professor Speaker Series. Um, we'll start again in the fall. Um, everybody be well, stay well, and we will um, see you soon. Thank you once again, Katerina. Hello, everyone. Take care, all.